Welcome to Redera. Today we are talking with Will Doig, the author of High Speed Empire, Chinese Expansion and the Future of Southeast Asia. Welcome to Redera. Thanks for having me. You have written a fascinating book, which generally doesn't get much attention in the media here in the U.S. Tell us a little bit more about what is the book all about and what's the central theme? Central theme focuses on a railway that China is planning to build from its southern city of Kunming all the way down the Southeast Asian Peninsula to Singapore. And this project is part of a much larger initiative that China has called the Belt and Road Initiative, which is a very kind of vague plan in some ways, but the basics are it's a plan to cover half the world in Chinese built infrastructure, stretching all the way from China into Southeast Asia, Central Asia, Africa, even Europe. Um, through a series of land routes and shipping lanes. And so the belt part of the Belt and Road Initiative is actually the land routes, which um, follow, you know, kind of the Silk Road direction uh, westward into Central Asia and Europe. And then the road part is the maritime t 21st century road, which would be shipping lanes that cross the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean and eventually end up in places like Africa and the Middle East and South Asia and places like that. The project has been described often as an economic plan, and it is. Uh, you know, China is a rising economic superpower, and I think it sees this project as a way to extend its economic influence and create a series of trade routes and tr trade routes and supply chains that all flow back to China. But at the same time, it's become inseparable from Chinese foreign policy, which is part of the reason that I call the book High Speed Empire, you know, I think that China, which is a country that does not form traditional alliances in the same way that, for instance, a lot of Western countries do, its way of reaching out to the world is through projects like this, which is really more of partnerships that are, you know, made one-on-one -on -one with other countries. And often those partnerships are, bus are, are buttressed by trade and investment. So that's the project in a nutshell. And my goal was to just look at this one portion of the project in Southeast Asia and try to use it as a prism through which to view the larger Belt and Road Initiative and see how it's going and see what challenges China might be facing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What China wants to achieve by having this rail network, Pan-Asian rail networks, and how long China has been trying to build this? Because the gen genesis of this go back quite a bit far. Yeah, I mean, the idea of a railway running all the way from China to Singapore has technically been on the table for decades. I mean, back when the colonial powers occupied much of Southeast Asia, you know, they had designs on building a similar, a similar railway. It sort of started after the Trans-Siberian Railway was built. Countries like England and France started thinking about building railways through Southeast Asia that would connect all of their uh, you know, sort of tropical trophies, and they did to a large degree, and a lot of those railways still exist in some form or another, but they never actually formed a contiguous route that ran all the way from China to Singapore. Uh, the idea for this current project that China is working on was actually first floated by Malaysia in 1995 at uh, one of the ASEAN summits, just a kind of combination of a lack of political will and a lack of money kept it from ever really getting off the ground. And it wasn't until China started to rise as a global power and a sort of you know master builder of infrastructure that they revived the idea and are now actually pushing it forward. But even for China, I, I, you know, th to actually get to the point where they have put tracks on the ground didn't really start to happen until the last year or so. I mean, I was in Southeast Asia reporting on this book in February through May of 2017. And at that time, uh, there were a there was absolutely no track on the ground. Um, I think now they've started to, you know, actually make some progress, especially in Laos, which is the first country that the railway would run through. Um, from what I've heard, it's about 20% complete. And you can see pictures of tunneling and uh, leveling the land and, and things like that. But it's definitely been a challenge. I mean, it's it's a challenge in many ways. And, you know, it, it, one of those ways would be just kind of the terrain that they're trying to get through. I mean, Laos, if you go to northern Laos, uh, it's hard to imagine a less hospitable place on which to build a railway. It's basically the foothills of the Himalayas with craggy peaks and huge valleys. And uh, the, the project will be mostly tunnel and bridges up there. And then you have a lot of political challenges, you know, the diplomatic hurdles of lining up 
quite literally, a bunch of smaller and uh, countries that might be a bit fearful of Chinese influence and getting them all on board with this project, that's been tough too. I think especially for a country like China, which has found it so easy to build a railway at home, I think they've been caught a little bit on their heels by how challenging that part of the project has been. China is interested in building this uh, railroad. Uh, why and what's in it for China? Well, I think that China sees a lot of advantages, but maybe the broadest one is just general connectivity of a region that they want to move into more aggressively. So, you know, we think of Southeast Asia as a very kind of booming region economically, and it is. What we don't really think about is how rural and undeveloped huge parts of Southeast Asia are. I mean, most of these countries have one major city. And then those cities are separated by these vast swathes of relatively undeveloped land. And I think that China sees an opportunity to use a project like the Pan-Asia Railway to urbanize a lot of these areas and develop them. And by urbanizing those areas, create new markets for Chinese goods. They also would like to reach out to some of the coastal areas of these countries, which would give China seaports and access to the Indian Ocean. A lot of people have noted that you know, China does not have a West Coast, and that's really kind of a difficult hurdle for them in a lot of the things that they would like to do. That is now when China is shipping goods by sea westward, they have to go south through the Malacca Strait, which is patrolled heavily by U.S. military, um, and then all the way around the tip of the Southeast Asian Peninsula. Um, but if they could gain control of ports on, say, the coasts of Myanmar and Thailand, they would be able to ship sort of directly westward and also import from the West places like the Middle East. And then, you know, I think finally one of the larger but probably unspoken motivations for them wanting to do this is simply to kind of put their stamp on Southeast Asia. I think China really views Southeast Asia as its backyard now that it is such a power in the region. President Xi Jinping has made no secret of the fact that he wants China to have a dominant sphere of influence in Asia. And I think that, you know, it sees this as sort of its calling card. Like this is, it's literally putting its footprint in a region that it wants to feel and announce that it has some de facto control over. Now that doesn't mean that it's storming in, you know, into a region that doesn't want it there. You know, one of the things that surprised me most when I was reporting there was how willing some of these countries are to accept all of this Chinese influx and Chinese influence in exchange for the the cash and the modernization and the development that China's offering. It's a kind of uneasy balance, I think. I mean, and that's the case with so many countries that China does business with is how do you accept these kind of once in a lifetime gifts or not gifts, that's not a good word, these once in a lifetime opportunities that China is offering without being completely overwhelmed by this country. And you really feel that when you're over there, this sort of struggle to balance that dynamic. So China has aims, strategic aims, and China also has beyond economic strategic goals as well. How Western colonization in Southeast Asia is different uh, from Chinese, quote unquote, economic colonization, because the Western powers in the uh, a year, a century ago, were looking to colonize these countries, but China wants to monetize these countries. Yeah, China is very touchy about the idea that it's colonizing countries with projects like these, and I I think that there is some merit to that. You know, I mean, Western powers literally came into Southeast Asia with guns blazing. And China is not doing that. I mean, none of these projects are being forced on any particular countries. These are worked out as, you know, deals between governments. But I think that what happens is that, you know, China is taking advantage of certain conditions on the ground that make some of these deals probably a little unscrupulous. So in a place like Southeast Asia, a lot of these countries are run by governments that are quite dysfunctional, that are often corrupt, that are impoverished, and they might be creating deals with the Chinese that don't exactly benefit the people of their country or that will have to be sort of dealt with by some future government down the line that the leaders who are currently running those governments know they'll be long gone by the time the bills come to pay. So I think that's the main criticism, and that's why China gets accused of this sort of economic colonialism. It's funny, just last night I was sitting on a panel 
with a couple of other people talking about the Belt and Road Initiative, and the other people on the panel were investors who have big investments in the Belt and Road Initiative. And their view is obviously much different, which is adheres to the Chinese Communist Party line, which is we are now a superpower and it is our turn to contribute. And these are win-win situations where everybody can rise with China. And I think that really oversimplifies the issue. I think that for some countries, these are genuinely really good projects and can help you know, countries leapfrog up the development chain in a way that they could never afford to do on their own. But on the other hand, there are definitely examples where countries have engaged in the Belt and Road Initiative projects in ways that are probably not that smart. And sometimes those are for sort of nefarious purposes. And sometimes they probably just have to do with kind of, you know, um, uh, like inept deal making or um, not being able to negotiate the disparate power dynamic. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't call it colonialism personally, and I was careful not to use that word in my book. But I do think that there is a form of a kind of power dynamic playing out that reflects the colonialism of Western powers. And that's why people equate them. In some sense, and you go through it in quite well in the book with examples, but in some sense, China has achieved a certain level and a quite bit of impressive achievement in, in, in doing complex constructions, whether it's the metro or whether it's the railroad, high-speed rails or any kind of bridges or roads, China has excelled in it. And now that China is taking that excellence and, and, and also it has quite a bit of overcapacity because it has overbuilt its domestic marketplace. So now it's taking it offshore. Tell us a little bit using a couple of examples of maybe in Malaysia or in Thailand or in Sri Lanka or even in Pakistan that, or in Laos, how it all is working out on the ground as a real example. And then we'll deal with these economic and strategic impacts. Well, I definitely think that China has become the, the greatest builder of infrastructure that the world has ever seen. I mean, it's hard to argue with that point. And that could really you know, play out well for some of these countries. Um, the way it's playing out completely depends on the country that you're talking about. So China has a couple of different ways of exporting its infrastructure building capacity. And one of them is to build things themselves. So for much of the Pan-Asia Railway, that's the plan is to China's actually planning the railway and then China will come in with its own workers and build the railway. And in a lot of cases, it will operate the railway for a specific number of years before it turns it over to the country that it's in. So it's truly... 100% a Chinese project, even though it's sold to these countries is benefiting them as well. But then you have some other situations where China is sort of partnering with other countries on projects that they want to do and coming in and, for instance, just providing uh, the labor or the technical expertise. So in a case like um, Malaysia, Malaysia and Singapore were planning a high-speed railway that would connect the cities of Kuala Lumpur and Singapore. It was a big deal. There were multiple countries bidding for the project. China was one of them. And this was a project that was not planned by China, really had nothing to do with China. It was completely an enterprise cooked up between Malaysia and Singapore, but China wanted to win the, the contract to actually build it because China is very good at building high-speed railways. Now that project's been put on hold since the latest Malaysian election. Um, the new prime minister has said that he wants to review projects like that. But it's a very different thing. I mean, this is, you know, China can in a lot of cases, come in and work on projects that aren't its own. And yet it still consider these projects to be belt and road projects because it sees them as benefiting China's larger goals in certain ways, which are better connectivity, more, you know, urbanization, stimulus on the ground. And I think that we're starting to see more of that type of engagement with a lot of countries um, and especially a lot of richer countries. You know, I think people are probably unaware, but China builds quite a bit of infrastructure in the United States. The U.S. is not all that great at building infrastructure these days, and China builds bridges here and roads here. They've lately been selling subway cars to major American cities. So if you're taking a, a train in Boston or L.A. or Chicago or Philadelphia in the next few years, there's a good chance it will have been uh, manufactured in China. So I think, you know, it's a really, it's kind of a broad-based strategy and probably a good one, as you say, I mean, they are, they've really overbuilt themselves at home to a large degree where they have more airports and factories and condominiums than they really need. And so One Belt, One Road or the Belt and Road Initiative is in some ways just China looking for other places to pour its concrete. 
And so that's the good side that, you know, China brings infrastructure, China brings much of a development that many of these countries cannot do it themselves or cannot afford to do it themselves. But often this good side also comes with financial terms or prices that many of these countries just cannot simply afford. And that's where the problem comes in. Yeah, and that's increasingly, I think, seen as a major problem with the with the Bell and Road Initiative. So a lot of development that was done in the 20th century by Western powers was done through grants. Um, China, in most cases, is doing this development as loans and with creating scenarios where it's lending massive amounts of money to often very poor countries that may never really be able to pay that money back. The most famous example of this has become Sri Lanka, wherein China essentially loaned the former government of Sri Lanka a lot of money to build a port and an industrial park and an airport in the sort of a remote corner of the country. That government left. Now there is a new government there that was not nearly as interested in engaging with China, but because Sri Lanka then owed so much money to China for the, building the project for them, the government essentially had to turn over the port and the industrial park and the airport back to China in a sort of equity swap to forgive the loan. So that's definitely become kind of the the poster child for this debt trapping that some people see China doing to poorer countries. I don't think that that is happening in every case, but even when it's not that blatant, there's definitely a dynamic in which once China becomes a country's biggest investor, it often expects that country to back China's kind of geopolitical aims. And you see it in more subtle ways. So, for instance, in Malaysia, the former prime minister, the the one who's now outgoing, he got into a sort of massive scandal in which he was accused of embezzling hundreds of millions of dollars. And China essentially bailed him out by trying to buy into a very large real estate project there. Once they did that, it was interesting. You know, you saw Malaysia start to be much more conciliatory towards China in in political sense in a political sense. So for instance, Malaysia is a country that has claims in the South China Sea. And yet after China made all these big investments investments in Malaysia, you could notice a sort of shift in tone when Malaysia would talk about the South China Sea issue. They would talk much more about it being, you know, something that should be worked out between countries or that, you know, we they needed to come to an understanding with China, whereas other countries that had claims in the South China Sea were being much more aggressive. So there's often kind of subtle ways that China achieves its aims in getting other countries to support it politically. And that is, again, usually, you know, through making very large investments in these countries. You know, some people see no problem with this. I mean, they say this is kind of China's geopolitical strategy. This is their way of doing things. And so, you know, maybe it is. But some people might find it alarming that just by offering what China frames as development aid, ends up translating into something that, you know, is somewhere between kind of um, persuasion and coercion. So if I summarize it, there are many moving parts here. The win-win situation as advertised and sold by China may only be win-win just for China in some sense. And uh, also China would come with lots of money and strings attached in some sense. And, And then once the portion of your debt is held more and more by the Chinese government or the Chinese controlled entities. Obviously, they're going to dictate you that you become their largest trading partner. And once you become their largest trading partner, you become more and more dependent on them for their manufactured goods. And then eventually China doesn't even have to fire a single bullet just to achieve its political aims. They just have to tell you and you just do it. That's the best way that they can achieve their political aims and goals through these economic advances or economic dependency. Yeah. And and at this stage in China's growth, China has absolutely no interest in getting into any sort of military engagement with another country. And so I think as a superpower that has an increasing number of sort of economic interests around the world, this is how it's kind of flexing its muscle. I mean, it's natural, I think, at this point in China's growth for it to want to kind of wield more influence, not just economic influence, but actual strategic influence. And this is the way that it's doing it. It's probably smart. It's 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 not the right time for China to engage militarily. And so this is sort of a way that it can do it by proxy, achieve similar goals in a different way. I also think it's very interesting that one of the things I was most fascinated by in terms of how China is gaining control in other countries through Belt and Road projects is 
actually kind of taking physical control of territory. So, you know, in a country like Laos, China has built a city that's right on the Ch- on the Chinese Lao border, and it's in Laos, but it's effectively a Chinese city, and it was created through a deal with the Lao government, where Laos essentially agreed to hand China a fairly significant amount of land right on the border in exchange for China developing and modernizing that land. And this is a kind of development model that China has pursued in other parts of the world as well. They're in Phnom Penh and Cambodia. They are building a large extension of the capital city there, and it's an entire Chinese-built city that is attached to the capital. Uh, they have one in Vientiane, which is called Bat Long, which is like also adjacent to the capital and essentially built entirely by China. And most of these, or a lot of these deals, are worked out in a way which, in which the country agrees to give China the land, and then China agrees to give the country development on that land in exchange. It's not necessarily a bad model, but it does raise interesting questions about national sovereignty and the, the permeability of borders and whether countries can and should trade away sovereign territory in exchange for Chinese development. The recent election in Malaysia, that was a pretty big issue. I mean, the, the biggest issue was the corruption in the, in the previous regime. But the incoming prime minister certainly talked a lot about the idea that China was annexing large portions of Malaysian land and turning it into foreign land. And that I think that that issue really resonated with a lot of Malaysian people. And they elected him in what was quite an upset, partially based on that. So whether or not China can continue with this indefinitely, I think, remains to be seen. I think that there's sort of a growing skepticism of this model in places like Southeast Asia and South Asia, where people are beginning to get a little bit anxious about how much control China is taking over physical territory in their own countries. But for now, that's the development model that China is pursuing and considering that China is probably going to be the the preeminent global developer of the 21st century. It's pretty amazing that this is the, the way that they're doing it. These countries ranging from Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, well, not Vietnam in this situation, but Laos and Myanmar, they have been looking for capital. And without China, there is nobody investing there. Now, in many ways, if you look at just from the Chinese perspective, what's wrong? They are giving them capital that nobody will invest in. They're bringing also technical expertise that they don't have. And they are modernizing these countries. And even if they have a piece of land that they use it, just as America did with the uh, Panama Canal for and controlled it over 99 years of lease and so on. In some ways, China can say, look, we are just repeating the history. We understand the history very well. We have understood how the rising powers of the West had done it. And we are just doing it. It's our turn. It's our time as China calls to contribute. They are just taking advantage of it. Absolutely. I think I think China would agree with you that they're basically taking a version of the model that was used by Western powers and kind of reinventing it for their own purposes. I mean, China itself is a country that certainly knows about Western powers coming in and using control of parts of its country. And now I think that it is following a similar playbook. Maybe the difference is that I think that there's the impression that when Western powers did international development, there was more attention paid to sort of making sure that it directly benefited the country that it was being done in. And also in the process, respected human rights or the environment or various things that would be important to that country. And the sense is that China is less interested in making sure that these projects are definitely beneficial to the country that they're being built in and are being built responsibly. Whether or not that perception is true, that's another question. But I think that's what makes people nervous. You know, it's interesting because I don't think I think the West sort of is surprised that China is not doing things exactly the same way that the West did them in terms of international development, although I'm not sure why. That seems kind of like an arrogant take to me and China's never really done things the same way and it's certainly their game now. But yeah, I I think this is something that China is learning as it goes. I mean, it's easy to forget that China has only been in the global development business for less than 10 years. I'm sure there was quite a learning curve when the U.S. started getting into this business and Europe did. But I think that China will probably learn to do what is necessary to get the job done. And in a lot of cases, that might be having to respect 
human rights. For instance, if you build a large project and it displaces people, then you have to resettle them or mitigate the environmental effects. Not because China suddenly cares about human rights or the environment, but because the country that it's working in would demand that. And if those countries start to demand that, I think China will go along, if for no other reason than to complete the project. This is probably where the West has um, a role to play that I would argue it's not playing, which is there's no way that, for instance, the United States can counter the Belt and Road Initiative. I mean, China, China has so much more power and ability to pull off these projects than the U.S. does at this point in history. But I think the role that the world is looking for the West to play is to help the countries that these projects are being built in sort of ensure that China is doing it correctly. And by that, I mean supporting civil society organizations in those countries or supporting a free press that can kind of hold China accountable when it's building these projects. That's the role that the West, I think, is expected to play at this point, although I I certainly don't think there's much appetite for that in the United States right now with the current administration. And I'm, I'm not sure how focused Europe or other Western powers are on that either. That's probably the best that the West can do and probably what they should be doing at this point. Those who are skeptic out there or who have a little bit different view, you can rewind back in about 40 years of time and say, well, just in the early 70s and late 70s, it was Japan. Japan was supposed to take over everything and Japan took up a lot of mines in Peru, in Brazil, in many parts of South America, all over Africa and many places just to meet its manufacturing requirement. And then eventually Japan faded away. Uh, Japan is still a strong economic power, but its global influence is nowhere near what it was in the 80s and 90s. And in many ways, China may become less interested and may find that these Belt and Road initiatives, that they may have ambitions, I mean, they may have aspirations, so on. They may never work out to the new Chinese leadership and they could be all abandoned and forgotten. It's true. I, I wonder if the, the main difference between Japan and China in this case is that President Xi has now essentially declared himself president for life. And this project is so his project that he, I think, sees it as a, a, a too big to fail endeavor and, and may continue to pursue it, even if it becomes less economically viable. But maybe not. I mean, that, that might be right. You know, China, depending on the way things go for China economically or growth wise, they may decide that a lot of these projects aren't worth it and will walk away from them. And China certainly has a history of walking away from projects, you know, even if it's already poured a lot of money into them. I mean, many of these projects are kind of let's throw at the wall and see if it sticks kind of, you know, endeavors. I think that uh, there's a lot of losses that China is willing to take and that are baked into the budget. And so I'm very interested to see 10, 15, 20 years from now how much of the Belt and Road has emerged and what shape it has taken because I think it's unlikely that it will look exactly like China is expecting it to look. It might look much smaller. It might be abandoned in places or maybe it'll be even bigger than we thought it would be. I mean, China has also has a reputation for exceeding the goals that it sets for itself. It built an entire high-speed rail system, the world's largest, in 10 years. So sometimes it, it kind of surprises us in the other direction, too. I think China definitely feels that the eyes of the world are on it with this project. It's pretty much the, the most high-profile development project in history. And everybody's sort of looking at it not just to see, will it work, but what does that mean about China's future? And I think, I think that China is a country that is very conscious of how the world sees it um, and wants to put forth something that will bolster not only its economy, but also its reputation. The way uh, the possibility is that there are, it can go in either directions and everybody knows China can exceed expectations as it has done in the past several times. Otherwise, it won't emerge as the rising power on the global stage. And China also has its own issues. And you bring it out very well in the book that uh, the forest city project in Malaysia, which is in many ways supported by the Chinese citizens because they are buying up the real estate made by the Chinese, for the Chinese, so to speak. It just happens to be on the Malaysian land. But because of the sudden decline in the foreign reserves, uh, Chinese government started telling its citizens, don't invest in the real estate overseas. And that had chilling effect all over the world. Yeah, I, I and I think that Forest City is a really good example of um, 
you know, what we're talking about, what can happen when China walks away from a project. Now, I wouldn't say China has walked away from Forest City, but just to give your listeners a little bit of background, Forest City is basically a Chinese city that China is building on a string of man-made islands off the coast of Malaysia. And the reason it's building the city in Malaysia instead of China is for several reasons. I mean, one is that a lot of Chinese people would like to live in another country, but they want to live in a, a place that feels like China. And so Forest City is being built as a city that is essentially marketed mainly to Chinese citizens who currently live in the mainland of China. It also wants to build a city that's near Singapore because Singapore is a very successful city. It has a lot of economic energy that a place like Forest City could absorb just from being adjacent to it. Forest City is also on the path of the planned Pan-Asia Railway, just by coincidence. And I think that it's a prime example of what we were talking about earlier, wherein China sees a way to divorce national territoriality from the cities that it's building. So even though the tech city is in Malaysia, pretty much everything about it is Chinese. And in fact, when I visited it and was sort of touring the model apartments as a, a prospective condo buyer, in one of the apartments, they had a TV on the wall and the TV is playing an advertisement for Forest City on a loop. And the advertisement is filled with Chinese people saying things like, we love living in Forest City. It's like we're living in China still. But what happened, as you noted, is about a year ago, China started to get very nervous about how much money was flowing out of the country. It instituted capital controls that basically prohibited Chinese people from spending their money outside the country in various ways. And one of those ways was on foreign real estate. And so what happened was Forest City, which is a city that's built for 700,000 people and had sold some of its condos already, started finding that the Chinese buyers it was selling those condos to were not allowed to continue making their payments for those condos because of the capital controls. So you end up with a city where it's half built, it's half sold, but nobody's really living there. And God knows what's going to happen with it. It really depends on the Chinese government. It might be that it, things start up again and people continue their payments and move in and it becomes a thriving, successful city. Or it could turn into one of China's sort of you know, infamous ghost cities, which is just built for hundreds of thousands of people, but is completely vaccinating and sometimes feels sort of ominous, I think. I mean, if this Pan-Asia railway is somewhat of a mechanism to urbanize Southeast Asia, is that urbanism model going to be the forest city model? Are they going to clone that type of development all up and down the rail line? And if so, is that going to result in a lot of abandoned urban development all along Southeast Asia? And if so, then what does that mean for the countries where all those abandoned cities are? I mean, it's one thing for China to make the decision to build ghost cities in its own country, but to you know end up building things like that in other countries where you then have to deal with the fallout in various ways. You know, I think that that's a real concern. Yeah, just as China can abandon a project, uh, these countries can also abandon repaying the debt because they think they were just sold under, you know, very difficult circumstances with a backhanded deal and they begin to say, sorry, we're not going to pay you. Yeah, and that, if that starts to happen on, on a large scale, I think that would be a very interesting dynamic for China to try to negotiate. I mean, you know, you could – That what's interesting about the, the way a lot of these projects play out is that very rarely – does a country just tell China to take a hike? I mean, some of them are engaging with China on belt and road projects, but they don't really want them. And they find other ways to sort of stall them or hold them up or just keep them from moving forward. Uh, Thailand is a master at this kind of thing. The Pan-Asia Railway has to run through Thailand to get, to, you can't get around Thailand. I mean, the current Thai government, which is the military government that's been in power since 2014, doesn't really want this railway. I mean, the project doesn't really make any sense for Thailand. Thailand already has railways running the route that China is planning. Thailand needs more freight rail, not really so much for passengers. But rather than to just say to China, we don't want this, what they do is say, oh, yeah, yeah, we should work on this. And then they hold ceremonial groundbreakings and they sign memoranda of understanding and they issue press releases about the project and then nothing happens. So I think that, you know, if you were going to see pushback on some of these projects more and more, it might be more in that form rather than countries just turning their backs on China, because not only is that a bad idea, probably strategically, but you also want to leave the door open for future Chinese investments if they're the kind of investments you want. We have been speaking with Will Doig, the author of High Speed Empire. What fascinates in the title of the book 
that you capture the word empire and the high speed. And in many ways, China is used to moving at a very fast pace when it comes to doing things within its own territory. And it is in a hurry. Maybe China is trying to achieve everything that should be achieved in 100 years and 20 years and may not still achieve the ambitions and goals it has despite doing all the hard work. Yeah, I, it's funny because it's both. On one hand, China likes to move very, very quickly, and they do with these big projects. And on the other hand, they think in very long timelines, certainly much longer timelines than a country like the United States does. So I think the speed with which these projects kind of unfold can be sort of jarring to people, especially if you're in the vicinity of them. But at the same time, we're talking about China's ghost cities. China argues that these aren't ghost cities at all um, and that they're building them to fill up with people on 20 or 30 year timelines. And so, you know, I think China really thinks in these these kind of very long term ways. And the problem with that for some countries is that when you think that long term and you're okay with, you know, a project taking decades to turn a profit, that might be fine for China, which is flush with cash. But for a country that lives paycheck to paycheck, I think that that's a scarier endeavor. And so I don't know, it's China. It's interesting to see China builds things with such a different mentality than the countries it's building them in. And this is another thing that I think China is starting to learn is that you can't just go in there and act like you do at home. You have to work with not only the government of the other country, but the people who actually live there. You know, one thing I noticed when I was in Laos is that I went to this tiny village up by the Lao-China border, and I was talking to some locals there about the Chinese people that had moved into the village, and they were very offended that one of them had opened a Chinese restaurant in the village without asking the local village chief for permission first. And it struck me, you know, that's a very inconsequential example, but it's also the kind of thing that could really, pardon the pun, derail a project like the Pan-Asia Railway, because even though China may have signed an agreement with the government in Vientiane, It's these small interactions on the ground that can help the project really succeed or fail. It's the local village chief who could throw sand into the gears of the whole thing if he wanted to in his little kind of kingdom there. So, you know, I think it's interesting that China is is still figuring that part of these projects out. And I don't know that they could do it quickly. I think that that is part of what is making some of these projects take a lot longer than China thought they would. China is an ancient civilization, a middle kingdom, and it has a long history of understanding history. China also wants to want to make sure that the world likes it. And China wants to accept the world and embrace the country and the people of China. But yet China has this, this debt trap or loan shark strategy when it comes to these kind of projects. Why doesn't the leadership of China just say, look, these countries, let's be honest here, these countries are never going to pay back or they're less likely to pay back. They have a lot of economic challenges. The political situation is very volatile. There's a lot of corruption. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong, do go wrong in the region. Let's just take Pan-Asia Railway as, a, as an example. And okay, we're gonna spend $20 billion and just openly say, no more debt, but if you allow us to do it, we'll spend $20 billion and build up this train. I think China will create more goodwill that way rather than ill will, because the end result will still be same or could be same that these countries may never repay them. At least in this case, China would be able to get this aim and objectives uh, achieved much faster and they will like them. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that China does itself a disservice by always portraying every project as win-win and the Belt and Road Initiative as being its way of contributing to the uplift of, of global society. It seems to talk about that all the time and nobody's buying that. That's not how rising superpowers or any superpower acts. There's no benevolent empire and, and nobody expects there to be. And yet I think China does a lot of the rhetoric doesn't match what they actually do, and that makes people distrust them. It's funny, like, I don't, I, I, there was, um, uh, gosh, I think it was like three or four years ago, I remember China put up this big billboard in Times Square in New York City, a big digital billboard, and it was essentially, it was like a, a five-minute movie that defended China's claims in the South China Sea, but it did it in this really, like, weird, ham-fisted way that tried to make it seem like a like a Hollywood blockbuster, and it was all these you know, beautiful images of islands and people frolicking on the beach. But of course, when you watched it, everybody knew what it was, which was a piece of propaganda that was issued by the the government in Beijing. I I hesitate to say this, but I think that a lot of the time, this is how 
things work in China. I mean, propaganda is sort of accepted. Say the economy is not doing well, then the government just sort of fudges the numbers. And if it's going to host the Olympics, then it hides all the people behind sort of like a fake city wall. And I, I think that China sort of thinks that this is it's okay to do these things. But other cultures, they don't think that as much. Like, I don't know if China realizes how obvious it is or how, how tone deaf it seems when they say things like this or act in these ways. And so, yeah, I think your point is really well taken. They would probably have more success with some of these projects if they would just be more honest about exactly what they're doing and say, yes, this is a railway for us. This is this is China's railway. Uh, this is going to help us achieve our goals in your region and not try to pretend like they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart for the local people, because I'm not sure anybody really believes that. Now, I mean, I should qualify that by saying some of these projects I do think are genuinely good for the countries that they're going to be in. It depends on the project and it depends on the country. This investment really is looked at by some of these countries as a once in a lifetime opportunity. And they're very happy that a country like China is paying a lot of attention to them. But a lot of the time, the rhetoric, it doesn't match reality. It comes off as false. And I wonder if that's something that will change or if that's just too embedded in China's DNA. Thank you very much uh, for your comments. And it was a pleasure to talk to you about in, uh, about the uh, initiative. And let's see what happens in the next two to three decades in the history and in the ways that China looks at two or three, three decades is nothing. It's just an, a mere dot in the, in, the, in the span of time. And let's, well, certainly we'll find out how far China progresses. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. We can talk again then and uh, see how it went. Exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>